So welcome all once again um, to this is our final um, session in the series of um, the Buried in Treasures Learning Community um, training sessions. Um, certainly this has been a long and um, winding path for us to get here, but it's it's a great, great um, delight. And good morning, Melody. Good morning, Sarah Lynn. It's great that we have together gotten to this point, and I'm hoping that we can certainly um, review today's final session and do a little recap as well as to um, from session one through session 13. I know some people may not have been with us throughout the entirety of the um the learning community, but I hope that the time that you attended and engaged with us was a meaningful learning experience that really offers you the knowledge, skills, and resources to move forward in your personal or your familial or even your professional um, role and responsibility in helping um, folks and supporting folks in their efforts and journey through the process of um, controlling and managing hoarding and decluttering. Um, evidently, as if you've had the opportunity to read the text from which we are doing most of our learning community, you know that simply reading the book is not going to solve the problem of hoarding or, or allow you to gain control of that um, circumstance, but certainly offers a guide and a pathway to how and to some of the potential obstacles you're going to face and some techniques and strategies for overcoming those obstacles and staying on track and, and sustaining throughout the process to get to the point where you can see those successes and be able to um, garner the motivation and the, um, the knowledge, skills, and support to help you sustain your successes and your efforts. So we're hoping certainly that you've been able to do that through in this process. And at this point, you're able to really take a look conscientiously as to how far you've come and what path you need to um, sustain and to maintain. So it's it's a journey. It's a whining, difficult, challenging, um, but rewarding journey. I think more than anything else is to reinforce the fact that um, hoarding like, like most um, emotional, behavioral, and, and um, really complex challenges are um, simply not overcome in, in one sitting, in one effort. It's, it's a sustained commitment to um, success and excellence. And uh, as we know, if, if you so desire, you're so committed, you can certainly sustain that success. And we're going to talk some more about what that looks like today. So today's Subject matter uh, is chapter 13, maintaining your success. And I want to certainly officially welcome you. Today's uh, webinar is hosted by DBHR through the Washington State Healthcare Authority. And as, as is the norm, we hope to make this an interactive meeting and to encourage you to ask questions and participate throughout the session. Please be reminded that the slides and the recording will be sent to you via email after the presentation. We hope that you've been able to gather them so far. Um, I am going to put again today's um, the call in information and as well as a, um, a link to today's um, session presentation so you can use that if you want to take notes. Um, I'm hoping that you have so far been able to get um, the copies because what I certainly saw is an indication that um, the recording and um, presentation have been sent almost, I think, a day or almost immediately after session. So I'm hoping that you've been able to, to gather those sessions. Um, but that's much for our intro. Um, as you know, we've gone from session one, from January to December. So we are there, we, we've made it this far, we persevered. And I, I'm certainly hoping that it has been as rewarding for you as it is for me. I know a number of us ha um, have taken on this task of, of, of um, sustaining and managing and, and working through this, this learning community, both for our personal um, 
rewards and gains as well as for our loved ones or people that we work with, or even simply to gain the knowledge uh, and skills that would enable us to do so, to provide that support and um, guidance to someone in the future. So we've come from the interest of what hoarding is to fighting the bad guys, you know, embracing the, the good guys, certainly sorting our own motivation, what keeps us on track, um, looking at the way in which we can really establish some organization and really putting our practice muscles to the test and really engaging in the action of actually organizing and decluttering. And here we are really taking an opportunity to take a step back and look at how far we've come, what we've accomplished and what needs to be sustained. So hence today's maintaining success um, session. So our usual housekeeping, we, we certainly ask you to share in the chat and well um, to engage in the polls. And, and certainly if you're having any difficulty with um, your audio video to use the call in option and to be reminded that subtitle options available to you as well. And um, certainly if there's any questions about uh, captions or subtitles, just let us know and we will certainly provide that information. Before we jump into um, today's great work, I want to also uh, recognize and honor um, Shelley Buckbider, who was the person who really um, started this learning community. Um, she was graceful enough in her transition from Rutgers University or another university um, to hand hand over in, in real classic style uh, to me, and I took the bat baton, and, and here we are. But I certainly want to honor her because I know for a number of you, you've certainly had the opportunity to work exclusively with Shelley before I came on to this um, learning community. But I want to honor her for the great work that she's put into this and certainly her commitment and dedication to supporting and helping people with hoarding disorders. As you know, hoarding is, is close to most of us, whether directly or indirectly, somewhere we're impacted by hoarding, whether in our personal or professional life, and it's it's an ongoing um, challenge to really both manage it from our perspective and to share with people who are yet um, on the path to doing so the um, the journey and the gifts of of really taking on the journey and and that to really emphasize the hope and the possibility for those who are still um, impaired and, and impugned by by hoarding. So it's important for us to share that. So a quick review, and is to really ask folks if they had the opportunity to, um, from the, for a November session, to work through um, some of the um, the tasks and some of the forms, you know, in terms of here comes the bad guys, taking on your brain, really looking at what do you believe form, the advantages, the disadvantages, worksheet, and the downward arrow. I'd like to know if anyone had the opportunity to use those um, scales and those screening um, options or guides in them. What was it like? How challenging was it? Uh, uh, was it helpful? Were you able to use them? Yeah, I guess I would say, and I think I already talked about this before, and uh, you already responded to it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it had to do with half a closet full of uh, clothes that I don't fit right now and so yeah I kind of went through the uh what would be the worst thing that would happen yeah. um and I guess I decided the best thing that would happen is that somebody else could uh, benefit from those clothes the worst thing would be that when I uh, did lose weight, that I wouldn't have them. But then the best thing is I could buy some new ones that did fit me. Absolutely. That were style. <laughs> yes, indeed. And celebrate the journey of getting to, to that point. Yeah. So that's that's great. And thank you for sharing that, Melody. I, I certainly admire you in your diligence and your commitment to doing so. And um as you know, we're all cheering for you. And <laughs> it's it's a journey that we're all taking. And I, I would like to know how many folks who have 
um, trousers and dresses and, and, and attire that <laughs> they can't fit into that they're still looking at with, with wishful thinking and hope as opposed to really looking at it as, uh, listen, am I celebrating where I am and where I'm going? And if 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 you recognize that, then it's time to, to let go, you know? So, but that's great. Um, I've also caught myself, Earl, uh, being in a store and, th you know, especially because it's Christmas, thinking, oh, my daughter would think that's so cute, you know, but absolutely. then I stop and think, does it have a purpose other than being cute? You know, does mm -hmm. she already have something like this? Is it something she really needs or would use? Because um, mm -hmm. I think sometimes we collect those cute little things and then we end up getting inundated with them and so yeah that's something else I've been doing is you know asking myself questions before I make a purchase great keeping that thinking it through and processing challenging those thinking and I know I think Melody you hit on a tremendous point this holiday season is simply the most difficult and, and arduous to in, endure and to and to um get through particularly if you're faced with with hoarding um problems so let's not um take this season and this time of year for granted but also recognize that you know, some of the gains that we've made can really help us to get to a better place in terms of distress tolerance, as well as good decision making during this period. Because at the end of the day, it's certainly about not just reducing the impediment of hoarding, but pursuing and living our meaningful, best active life that we intended to. And just hoarding just became an obstacle along the way. So it's 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 not about just kicking the can down the road. It's about really looking conscientiously at where we are, where we came from, and where we want to be, and what it's going to take for us to stay on track. So fantastic. But certainly, if people have had the opportunity to to do that. I want you to share. You can certainly give me a thumbs up or a yes in the chat, or if not, no. What I certainly encourage you to do, particularly during this season, is to really conscientiously. Um, practice some of these techniques and approaches that is going to, even if it gives you, you know, nominal gains, it may save you from a stand, a financial, from an emotional, from a behavioral standpoint. It's important for us to sustain our efforts and not fall prey to, oh, it's the holidays. I'm going to just do what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to get started again in January. There is no getting started in January. We are in the here and now and got to continue to work on it. So that's that's our commitment, our collective commitment to keep pushing on during this season. All right. So today, what we certainly want to accomplish is, is to really describe those steps for praising your progress towards controlling hoarding and to examine strategies for maintaining progress. Because as we know, planting your flag on the top of the mountain is just the beginning of it, right? <laughs> Getting there, and we wanna make sure you can put up, um, make sure you get all your tent and everything there on the, on, on the top of the mountain and you can camp on the mountain and celebrate those, those gains. So that's going to be important to really determine the strategies and to really, um, implement those strategies for maintaining progress and coping with potential setbacks. We want to formulate a plan as well for establishing a life beyond hoarding, because hoarding is not just um, it's not our life. It simply is a part of our um, life that we need to put in its right perspective, and we need to regain that intended life, that purposeful life, that life full of activity and and celebrating the things that we want to do and need to do for ourselves, despite um, the challenge of hoarding. So that's what we want to look at today. So what I'm going to do, and I know for a number of folks, and I, for those who are, I'm going to warm you up with some questions. So what I'm going to certainly um, do now is to present the poll. And this poll is kind of an overview of some of the um, the materials and the, the knowledge that we've gained over the, the last 12 months but it's to really give you some perspective about your own awareness and knowledge of not just the overall understanding of the hoarding problem, but some of the strategies to addressing um, those challenges. So it's really 
kind of an overview of the entire process that we've we've come um, across. So I want to just give you an opportunity to look at your own awareness of where we are. And I'm going to launch the poll. So take take a few minutes and answer the question the best as you can, and then we'll review to see our own collective knowledge as to where we are. So take a few more minutes and, and, and respond to the poll as best as you can. And just let me know that you're seeing the poll. Yes. Fantastic. So it's a little lengthy, but take a few minutes. I just kind of want to get a good overview of where people are. Which is the bad guys, ways of thinking that serves as obstacles is the number one reason don't, people don't overcome their hoarding problems. Oh, I, didn't. I know. I I always tell people when you read with my quiz, don't overthink it. <laughs> Just respond. The first thought that comes to mind often is the best way to go. So we're going to give folks another minute or so to just respond as best as you can to the polls and then um, we'll see where we are. Okay, so another five seconds and then I'm going to end the poll and we'll look at the results. All right, so let's take a good look and I'm gonna share the results. So the first question is according to the DSM-5, hoarding disorder is present when the following criteria are met. Persistent, difficult discarding or depart, um, parting with possessions. This difficulty is due to perceived uh, need to save the item. The symptoms result in accumulation of possessions. The answer, the, the, the most accurate answer is certainly all the above, the A, B, C, and J. What's um, very important to note is particularly with DSM criteria for a disorder, in order for it to be deemed a disorder, it must create or cause clinically significant distress or impairment in functioning. So even though it's, it may seem that each one of those um, earlier criteria are part of that process, part of the determination, it has to really create that clinically significant um, distress or impairment in functioning. Secondly, which of the, the bad guys, and the bad guys is ways of thinking that serves as obstacles, is the number one reason for pe that people don't overcome hoarding problems. And we talk of avoidance and excuse making, going for the short-term payoff, it's just not my priority. 
The answer is, and it may, I hope it doesn't surprise you, is that simply you have to make it the priority. If it's not a priority, it's, it's, it's going to be very difficult. So the number one, even though all of those are good reasons, the number one reason is really making it a priority. If it's not, if it's, if you, if it's not a priority, then it's very difficult um, to overcome it. You have to make it the priority. Um, which of the good guys, which are techniques to help you tip the balance in your favor, is related to how long you spend working on the program. So when we talk about the length of time, the duration of that effort um, on a daily basis, we're talking about your practice muscle. That is that constant engagement in the process of decluttering and organizing that has to be in place on a daily basis. You've got to put that in place. Um, hoarding is a problem of emotional, mental, behavioral, and social well-being. And every one of you said true, and that's, that's absolutely true. It's really a all-encompassing, really expansive um, challenge in that it really impacts the emotional, mental, behavioral, and social um, well-being of, of, of those faced with that challenge. Um, as we know, many people who hoard experience ambivalence and need to face it head on and work through it. We ask which of the following and describes, best describes ambivalence. Um, the answer there is having those opposing beliefs or feelings at the same time. Um, because oftentimes you question whether someone is ambivalent or, or, or they're really experiencing apathy, which is they don't have um, any care at all about the problem. The reality is in hoarding, most people really face ambivalence. Like most behavioral challenges, ambivalence is really um, the challenge there where you have those two opposing feelings at the same time and you have to work through them to really challenge the negative feelings. Um, number six, the first step in the process for reducing acquiring is to change your thoughts about acquiring. No, the answer, and even though all of those are steps, the, the first step is really discover what, how, and why you acquire. Because once you have that understanding, the other things are easier to address. So be, be aware of that. It's really understanding um, what, how, and why you require, uh, acquire is really going to help you um, determine how best to go about addressing the, the challenge. To start seeing real progress, your daily sorting or letting go sessions should last at least 30 to 60 minutes. We want to work our practice muscle up to that level because that's where we see the most tangible of, um, progress when people are working up to that 30 to 60 minutes threshold. When is the best time to schedule sorting and organizing sessions? And that was kind of a, um, a tricky question. Mornings, evenings, it, it, the answer is when you feel clearest and most capable of sustaining. And ironically, that can be evenings or afternoons, but ultimately it's not simply about designating an arbitrary date, but to know your own brain and understand clearly when you are your clearest, you feel your clearest and capable of sustaining that effort. So thank you so much for certainly sharing those um, feedback. I, I hope it helped you to really take a look at the whole collection of, of knowledge, skills, and resources you've gained throughout this um, training session. That was the objective. So let's get right into today's element. So we are at the point where by looking at how we can sustain our um, successes and our gains so far, it's really, when we look at it from the um, stage of change perspective, we are at that maintenance stage. And that maintenance stage has some clear discernible characteristics. Um, and, and when we speak to that maintenance stage, we're talking about having achieved the goal and, and you're working on maintaining the change. The expectation is that for most folks, the maintenance stage really sh um, should be about six months subsequent to really engaging, um, to taking action. Once you've been able to sustain that change for about six months, 
and beyond is when you are in the maintenance stage. So you have gone through the, con the pre-contemplation and contemplation uh, and working through preparation and action. And now you've actually made those changes and you've sustained them for um, more than six months. And so you're in the maintenance stage and there is some clear and discernible um, intervention that we can utilize in our efforts to support our clients or loved ones when they're at this stage. So it's important to, to note we're at the maintenance stage. And during the maintenance stage, we're, we're talking about planning and recovery lifestyle. So we're talking about future planning, like for example, planning a life beyond um, hoarding, planning to resume our social activities, planning to invite folks to our house since we've decluttered and it's 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 um, ready for its intended use, planning to live beyond hoarding in meaningful, tangible ways, as well as planning to maintain our gains, continuing to work on making decisions that prevent uh, accumulation, that prevent unnecessary acquiring, that really helps us to stay organized and stay engaged in meaningful activities in our life um, and to keep hoarding at bay. So that's that's where we are in terms of the maintenance stage, um, six months subsequent to really um, taking some decisive action and seeing some gains. So it's important to note, and, and this is, I, I think, one of the quotes that I found rather um, poignant and meaningful to where we are at this stage of working through our hoarding concerns, which is success is no accident. It is hard work, perseverance, learning, studying, sacrifice, and most of all, the love of what you're, do uh, what you're doing or uh, learning to do. And that quote came from um, the great soccer player, ironically, we were in the, um, just completed the World Series of Soccer or football as we call it, but um, Pele, who's a um, Brazilian um, icon of soccer that really made that particular quote and it was really poignant um, to where we are. So it, it's not an accident. We, we don't attain that level of success by just doing things wantonly. It's, it's really perseverance, learning, studying, sacrificing, putting all those efforts in place to, to get to these gains, to get to this point. And it's important for us to recognize that because that's what it's going to take for us to sustain our success. So Pe Pele um, was very poignant in, in, in his um, claim or quotation that we're going to use to help us maintain our success. So the maintenance stage, um, it's really about maintaining a new status quo, a new normal, a new way of existing and living and seeing ourselves in the world, having that worldview that, you know, there's life, there is a way of living and existing and 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 um, thriving, um, even in the face of potential um, obstacles and with our continued effort to control hoarding. There is a life that we can certainly live and embrace and engage in actively, meaningfully. So we need to be mindful of how much progress you've made to constantly reformulate your life rules and acquire new skills to deal with life and avoid relapse. So it's really that renewal and, and really engaging in recovery planning and, and relapse planning so that we stay on course and, and not fall um, victim to the traps that are definitely um, there in our, in our existence in, in a state where hoarding is a prominent part of our lives. So anticipate situations where a relapse can occur and prepare coping strategies in advance. So it's not to be naive or, or to assume that because we've made successes and gains, things are just going to continue to flow nicely. There are going to be challenges and we need to prepare in advance. We need to really have our toolkit and our repertoire of coping mechanisms and strategies at, uh, at the ready and accessible to us. Be aware that what you're striving for is worthwhile and meaningful. So we have to attach really significant meaning and, and um, vibrance and that concept of, of ownership to where we are and where we want to, to remain so that we, we are not losing sight of, 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 of the goal. And to be patient with yourself. You're going to have some slip-ups. You know, uh, 
recognize that it takes a while for a new behavior and patterns to, to become second nature to you. This is not going to happen overnight. You've worked so hard to get here. It's now important for you to be thoughtful and patient with yourself. And resist the temptations to return to old habits. I think both Melody and I spoke about it, how this season can be a trap, can be a slippery slope for really uh, revisiting those old habits. You know, I, I always say that to folks. I had my own experience um, a few days ago. I'm always the last person to put up a Christmas tree or to help myself with his menorah. I, I always, I'm the last person to do so. So I'm going through all my lights and all my stuff and I'm like, ah, oh. for me to even think of undoing these stuff and unraveling them, maybe I'll just go buy a new set. You know, it's time for a new set. And I look at it and I'm like, I bought a bigger tree. So maybe I'll have four instead of the three that I have. And this is a great time to, you know, get it. I, I've, I've come to a point where I've gotten rid of some stuff. So now is the time for me to celebrating by buying some new one. And there was this lingering thought in my head, like, Earl, you lost your mind. What are you talking about? If you need new lights for Chris and you have a whole bag that you can untangle, your thoughts are, <laughs> you're on the wrong path. So I went through diligently through my um, uh, array of lights, found three sets of colorful one, was actually able to get rid of two sets that I've had that I've never used in but five years. And I felt so good when I put up my, my, my Christmas tree with three sets of lights that actually work. And then I realized I had some spare bulbs. So even for those that lost bulbs, I was I had spare bulbs. I had more spare bulbs than, than actual real light. So I didn't need anything. And I felt so good. So the Christmas tree that I put up was not just about celebrating the season it gave me it it was it eliminated as well where i was in my ability to make decisions about acquiring stuff so i'm celebrating both christmas and my 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 success in restricting and re, uh, reducing my unnecessary um acquiring so i'm in a good place with that i was proud of myself so I, I'm, I'm sure during this season, you're going to come across a lot of those opportunities to recognize and acknowledge your growth and success. Be mindful to actually gauge it, recognize it, compliment yourself, reward yourself, and actually stay in, in good stead. It's important to do so. So it is helpful to reevaluate your progress in moving up and down through the stages of change. And we'll know that we're all, you know, we're going to face ambivalence every time we hit the store. <laughs> it's going to happen. We just have to work through it and process through it and recognize that, you know, we are not defined by our challenge, but more by our overcoming our ability to live meaningfully. So we, we certainly recognize where we are in terms of the maintenance stage. And it's important to appraise your progress towards controlling hoarding. Because if you don't really take stock of your progress and, and really evaluate it, it's very difficult to have a sense of purpose and meaning to move forward. So ex examine the evidence. What is better? What is not better? How things are for you right now? Ask those questions and answer those questions honestly and conscientiously. Examine the outcomes, the severity, the safety and quality of life, impact on daily functioning and the sanitary conditions. Those things that we worked on in, in chapter three, really taking a look at those um, assessment tools and assessing where we are. And we start first by examining the evidence. Remember in our early phases when we were asked to take some photograph of the state of affairs in your house and really look at every room and take photos. We talked about taking as much as you can. It's better to have more than less. And now we're at the point where we want you to take those photos of the current state of things. And then look um, you know, conscientiously at how different they are or whether or not they're the same. Really take a conscious look from, a, pic, from a, um, a visual perspective as to how far you've come and where you are. 
So in chapter three, you were instructed to take those photos of the state of your home. And we said, go room to room to preserve the image of what it looked like before you started the program. And, and we said, skipping it wasn't an option. You had to do it. It was important to do so because the gains were going to be important when you get to this point. Um, and so the time has arrived for you to do, to do that. What do the photos tell you of your current state of affairs? Do they look better? Just acknowledge those areas where there, there need to be work to be done. So there may still be some areas in your home where you know you see things that can be changed and adjusted and organized. What we want you to focus on is those significant changes that have occurred. And if you look at these two photographs, it picture tells a thousand words. You know, what do the pictures that you've taken tell you? about where things are for you now, as opposed to when you started out this program. I'll be honest, you know, if you say, Earl, I can't even think, I can't even stand the thought of taking a photograph, because it, it just, it just hurts me to think that I don't, I will tell you, taking the photograph is still important, because there is no way that you can look at just, but if you're um, naturalized, and determine whether or not you've made any progress. It's good to have that comparative analysis so you can actually look at it because sometimes the room that you're more focused on may not be the room that you've made the most changes on. So if you don't take those photos and compare them, it's going to be very difficult for you to do good assessment. But our hope is when you took those photos and you compare them to the earlier ones, there are noticeable, tangible difference in the state of your clutter or the state of the um, accessibility to the home. So if anyone is willing to share where things are, I would love to hear what that brought to you, what kind of um, understanding or what kind of vision you gain from taking and looking at the comparative of those photos. And Melissa says, being a visual person means the photos are incredibly helpful, even to show small changes. Absolutely. And that's the main aspect of it. Because if you see this, um, the small changes and they're tangible, they're evidence, they're right there, you can't ignore it. You can't deny it. And it, it's going to give you an awareness that will allow you to really look at yourself and have a perspective. Because if you've made small positive changes, it allows you to then question when you feel overwhelmed. You're able, because I can say to you, if I see those small changes and you see those small changes, you are able, you are capable, you can, because there's evidence to suggest that you already have. And that's what's important. So don't be shy, don't be afraid, take them. And have a comparison. Write it down. Note the comparison. Or in some cases, if someone, um, a loved one or someone that was engaged and involved in you during this process, have them give you their perspective. Because sometimes, as we know, we're so caught up in our own mind's eye and our, our, our vision is hard for us to give an honest um, opinion about things. Sometimes we need to get that from an external source. So if you have someone who you know has been through that process or were you in the early days and you can help, they can help you process the comparison of the photos, it is also a helpful place to be. So, so make sure that you take that task and engage in. So we talk about looking at some assessment tools that we're going to use to examine the outcomes. We want to look at the overall severity. So we want to use that hoarding rating scale. We want to look at the safety and quality of life because noting whether or not you now have a clear and discernible egress and entrance is significant. Whether or not right now you can actually get off your bed and step onto the floor or the carpet and there is not, you know, you don't have to hurdle over those things are significant. Whether your quality of life is improved, whereas you can get from your bedroom to your kitchen 
and to other areas of your home without fear of stumbling over stuff. You can do so with a nightlight or, or, or do so in the dark. Um, it's, it's going to be important to note. The impact on daily functioning is also important to assess. And you use the, um, are your daily um, activities impaired by hoarding scale to really give you a sense as to how much you can use the, your areas of your home as intended, as opposed to where you were in the past. And the sanitary conditions of your home is going to be important to note. My question to you is, have your scores on those scales improved? Because if you have taken the time to evaluate and assess the outcome, it is going to say, like I said, allow you to have some level of awareness to impact and to really um, positively um, enhance your motivation to keep at it. I'm hoping that your scales have, uh, have improved. I'm confident that if you have kept up to work and stay on task and work that um, practice muscle, you would see um, evidence of improvement um, across different areas, severity, quality of life, uh, functioning and sanitary conditions of your home. And that's going to be important to note. So fill out that questionnaire, actually um, measure those outcomes and, and, and be honest with yourself, you know, and you'll hear me say this over and over again, be honest with yourself, be honest with yourself. And you're like, Earl, why are you keep repeating that? Because that's a major element of what you have to do. You really have to have your eyes and mind really aligned. There, there need to be some level of honesty about where things are and where you've come, how far you've come. I would say that's true with any change in our lives. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's important because I always say, like anything else, if you practice honesty, it becomes second nature. What does your success say about you? That's what we wanted to focus on. Even small changes, small successes, it speaks to the point that you have power, you're empowered, you have control. At some point, you made the decision to say no when, when your natural instinct was to say yes, and it made some changes. So you have control. Even if it's minimum, there is a level of control that you have and you have self-discipline. You've been able to make a decision. And that's fantastic. That's true, um, Sarah Lynn said, self-discipline is the biggest for her. And I know for me, that sense of power, that sense of I can, I am able to, I have what it takes is important that we may find one of these or all of these may differ or have greater importance at some point for us. But even the smallest degree of success speaks to these realities, these elements of who we are and how we exist in the world. We are empowered, we have control, and we can, ex we can um, exhibit self-discipline. And that is reinforced by those ev the evidence that proves that we've made some change and we've and we've succe uh, succeeded in some areas, and that's important to have because we will constantly need to go back to that bag, and pull out that evidence and reminder of power, control, and self discipline, because that's what it takes to get beyond um, the impediment and the impairment of hoarding in our lives. So we want to, now that we've gotten the gains, we're here, we want to look at the strategies for maintaining success. What are they? And, and we've, we've accumulated them along the way. It's really about sticking to your schedule for organizing. We talk wantonly about, you've got to make this a daily practice, a daily habit. You've got to work up that practice muscle to get you up to the point where you're putting in that 30 to 60 minute um, effort uh, of working on organizing. Remember, if clutter is present, we tend to add to it. And it may sound weird and like, Earl, oh, how does that make any sense? Realistically, why we say that is 
if a place is cluttered and simply adding something to it is, doesn't really make much of a difference, right? If it's cluttered and then you just throw another piece of paper on a pile of paper, it's a little easier for us to do so without thinking because we don't feel like we're making any, you know, an, a significant negative on something that's already uh, um, inclining that way. So it's important to note that if we have a decluttered environment, you'll have to think twice about cluttering up because you know the effort and energy you put into getting it into that state. You, it's, it's going to be harder for you to then undermine those efforts. So that's why it's important for us to work to the point where we get an area clear, get it to that point, because then it gives us the impetus to not un undo what we've done. So remember, if plot is present, we tend to add to it. And if it's not present, we tend to keep it that way, right? Uncluttered. That's, that's the natural tendency. Make rules for organizing and letting go. We've worked through that. We have to have those five basic rules at a minimum that we're going to actually display prominently on the refrigerator someplace to help us stay organized. And for a number of us, it, it can be varied. I know for a number of folks that I work with is all bills should go to this drawer. It should never go from the mailbox to the table to the place you, no, it goes directly into that drawer until we're ready to organize it. Or if it's an advertisement or something that we know we don't need, it goes from the mailbox to the recycling bin. One trip. <laughs> no, no um, stop offs, no drop offs, no hesitation. That's the only way we can stay on task. So we have to have those rules, those hard and fast rules that we're going to adhere to and live by. And some of it may simply mean, you know, Credit card bills, if we're able to, we should only or we should do our best to ensure that they're electronic. We're not going to have the paper paperless uh, paper option. We're going to choose paperless option to reduce our um, accumulation of stuff. So we have to know those rules that we've already developed. We have to have them prominently uh, located and we have to adhere to them, remind ourselves of them and constantly keep them in the forefront of our mind. And this is the time where we must now look at enjoying the company of others at our home. Because we've done the work of decluttering. We now want to use our home and areas of our home as intended. That living room that we have, the great fireplace and all that stuff that was blocked by all that stuff, now we've cleared it out. Now we need to light that fire. We need to have that you know, chair that we enjoy we want to have it there. We want to enjoy the warmth uh, of that fireplace. And in order to do that, we, we want to make sure that that place that we cleared out remains that way. So we have to actually do that and invite people over. Because remember, part of the challenge was, whether consciously or not, as we acquire more and more and the hoarding became more and more significantly um, impairing to us, we tend to reduce people coming into a house because we didn't want to have to deal with the questions and the judgment. Now that we've done the work and gotten to a better place, we want to now invite people over so that they can enjoy that um, space with us. And we can also demonstrate, and I'll say this from, from, from as an earlism, a little selfishly and a little egotistically, we want to show them that we could. We did. We were powerful. We were self-disciplined enough to make those changes, and we want them to share in the enjoyment of our successes. Melody says, sometimes I plan to get together just so it will motivate me to clean. Absolutely. There is no greater motivation than knowing someone is going to come there and sit there and look around. So you want to make sure you do that. And that's fantastic. It's a great motivational tool, and we speak to that later. It's important to... So use that as a way of, of, of staying motivated. Um, identify which good guys work for you, best for you. Like I said, all the strategies and techniques are not going to work for you. Or they're not going to work superlatively to the point where you want to use all of them. But know which ones work. You know, know whether you're thinking it through is what works for you. 
you know whether or not avoiding um, some of those things work best for you. For a number of us, you reach the point where you're like, okay, I am, I am through, I'm done with yard sales. Yard sales is not on my list anymore. I'm just not, it, it just doesn't work because you may not be able to get through that process of making those decisions. So you have to get to that point where you know which techniques work for you. And continuously challenge your thinking. Because as we know, this is really about how we process and think through things to make those decisions as to whether something is contributing to our joy, is it celebrating our lives, is this enabling us to live meaningfully and live in a way that we intended to? And that's going to be important for us to challenge those thoughts as they come up. When those um, bad guys come up, we want to be thinking through those processes, challenging those thinkings. So sticking to your schedule for organizing, working up that practice model, um, muscle to the point where it's well conditioned, it is imperative, it is critical to keep that practice muscle to the point where it needs to be. It is more likely to become a habit that feels just like getting dressed in the morning. That's what our practice muscle needs to be. You must be empowered to work despite being tired, upset, busy, or bored. You have to have a schedule and stick to it. Sorting or letting go must become your highest priority to get the most gains out of it. So by this time, the expectations that your practice uh, muscle will be well-conditioned and it's second nature to just do 30 to 60 minutes of sorting and letting uh, and organizing in your life. If not, you need to keep working to get there. And we spoke earlier about clutter attracts clutter. And that's important to note because in many regards, we have that sense that people get to the point of being like, Earl, I've made some great success in my living room. My kitchen is fabulous. My bedroom, I, I didn't even realize I had that um, bed spread or that stuff. And now it's laid out there. I can look from the kitchen and see it, whatever, however your house is set up. What is also going to be important is that area that still has some clutter that you keep working on. So, because think about how your actions influence by clutter in your home. Then think about how it influence, uh, is influenced by cleanliness. So what we know is that generally for space or clutter, we tend to believe that another piece wouldn't make much of a difference. So we add, you know, unconsciously or consciously add things to it without thinking. So what's important here to, to note, and, and this is my message to you, is if you notice some clutter piling up, don't wait. Take care of it immediately because it offsets that tendency to just say, well, it's already cluttered, so adding a little stuff is not going to do anything to it. If you take care of it immediately, you are then honoring the work that you've put into the clutter, and you're also recognizing the importance of precedent setting. If you do it immediately, it's less likely to become an overbearing, challenging issue for you. So remember the concept. Clutter has magnetism. It tends to attract other clutter. So if you keep things cleanly, you don't have to worry about, you know, that propensity to go back to just adding things to what you already have as a challenge. So making and applying rules for organizing, we talk about it's important to have those five rules developed and put in a prominent place to remind you. And those five rules has to be significant for you. We've talked about them earlier. I know for me, it's bills go to a specific place, you know, advertisement and all the other things goes directly to the recycling bin. I also know that I consciously have one winter shoes out of the door. For me, that's important. I can't have, you know, one that is black, one is gray, one is thick, just to, to think of all the uh, variances that may occur. No, I have one at a time. If it's snowing outside, I take the one that is just for cold weather up and I bring the one down that's for snow down. So I have one at the front door. You have to know what rules work for you. Make it visible and easy to remind you. Prominently put it in the refrigerator or wherever um, works for you. And I'd like to know from, from, 
from any of you, what are some of the rules you've developed and you abide by? What are some of those rules that work for you? And I know I'm hoping that some of you have more than five, but we talk about five as, as, as the starting point. What are some rules that work for you? Melly says, I have a large basket in the garage where Goodwill donations go. When full, we take it to Goodwill. Absolutely. And the important thing is it's in the garage, right? It never slips back into the house. Great. Absolutely. Any other rule that worked well for someone that someone has? Because listen, we're all in the business of acquiring rules. What we can acquire now is techniques that work. You don't have to worry about accumulating techniques. You can accumulate as many techniques as you want and we don't consider that hoarding. Sarah said, I do something similar. I keep a bag in my car for things to donate and take it to Value Village when it's full. Absolutely. It goes directly to the place it needs to go to, one shot. So the less deviation we have, the better. But that's great, but just remember, even if you have those rules in your head and they've worked for you, a great reminder is to write them down and prominently display them so that they serve more as a reminder. Because the old saying is, if we remember, you know, if all we have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It's an old adage, but it's, it's, it's really a prominent one. So if you only remember one, one technique, you'll, you'll tend to just rely on that. As opposed to if you have all five or more noted on a, a prominent place, you can actually reference it because it's there. It's visible, it's available to you, it's accessible. Invite and entertain guests at your home. Be unafraid. Because even if that person says, well, you know, Melody, it's really lovely to see all the great furniture you've had. I haven't seen them in two years, you know, but I still, you know, I'm still concerned about your kitchen area. You can stop them right there and say, listen, the, the first part of what you said is what I'm going to entertain today. I'm glad that you recognize that I've done a great deal of work in my living room. I will continue to work on it, but thank you for recognizing the efforts. So you can take ownership of that and take, I always say, take whatever piece works for you and actually acknowledge the other things. You know, before that person jumps into that um, observation, you can share with them. Listen, I'm continuing to work. I've done six months. It's the fact I've made great gains in six months. I'm actually able to entertain you. You know, I can pull out, you can actually bake that cake or meatloaf or cookies, whatever it is this Christmas without wondering about you know, whether or not you have the capacity and the availability and the, and, and the, the cluttered space to do it, now is the time to benefit from those gains. Entertain. Don't be afraid at all. That's a great place. I think Melody said it uh, prominently. Having inv inviting people is a motivation to keep things clean and clear and sanitary and in and, and good stead. So take that as a motivational tool. Which good guys work well for you? You should be able to recognize and have a list of those that work best for you. Because undoubtedly, some exercises work better than others in helping you control your hoarding. Write down how each of these good guys help you make and maintain progress towards decluttering. Whether it's keeping your eyes on the prize, thinking it through, testing it out, developing the right skills, or conditioning your practice muscle, you ought to know which good guys work best for you and keep them in mind. And which bad guys give you the most trouble? Because if you don't know those that catch you off guard, it's easy for you to be caught off guard. So you need to know which one is the most challenging of the bad guys. Which obstacle really give you the most difficulty to overcome? Challenging your thinking. Write some notes on ways of thinking that made decision-making about certain things challenging. Have that narrated, have that written. Remember, you will likely still have some difficulties with making certain decisions. But your commitment to challenging these ways of thinking using those strategies learning chapter five is going to be imperative and, and critical to sustaining 
your success. Occasionally remind yourself how these bad guys affect you. It's just not my priority. Avoid avoidance and excuse making. You know, going for the short term payoff or letting unhelpful beliefs get in your way. Know which one of those bad guys are the most challenging for you to overcome. I know for me, oftentimes it's the overthinking or confusing myself that presents the biggest challenge. So I have to stop and really take stock of that and just use the rules, use the techniques. Don't overthink it. Like I said, one shoe at a time. Simple. And Melody says, your hardest decision is regards to things that have a family connection. Absolutely. And that often happens, particularly this time. For those of us at this time in the holiday season where, you know, it's so much a family-oriented engagement and so forth, those issues come up. I know some folks who have 15 different stockings, and it's only you, only two people living in the house. You know, but 15 stockings are hung on the mantle. And I'm like, um, after a while, you have to recognize a stocking is really supposed to be for someone who's there. And, and a, you lot know, of, a lot of Christmas past. <laughs> yes. And sometimes to, to make this Christmas special, you have to let go of the Christmas past. Right? You have to, I always say, create new memories and be okay with living in the present. Staying mindful. And I know sometimes it's tough. Because particularly for some of us who've lost loved ones, this is the tough time. You know, you may have a stocking up there for someone who was uh, important in your life and may no longer be there. But if you put that person's stocking up, you can get rid of your other three people who are no longer in your life and have, don't have that level of meaning. So it's okay to have that. And those are some of the, the, yeah, the, the things that you need to be aware of, you know. You have to recognize at some point that if the mantle is, is, is leaning this way because you have, you know, 500 different ornaments on it, it's not cute. It's not, it's not perfect. The time has come for you to reorganize them. And sometimes it may see there's redundancy. You have four Santa, or you have five menorah. Listen, you can't light five menorah. One is good enough. So we have to be aware of those things, you know, the conscientious. But, but what if they're all different and they're unique? And uh... <laughs> You know what? It's a good question. Here's my thing. You only have two eyes. <laughs> there you go. You can't see all their uniqueness in that regard. <laughs> Uh, you know, so even if that's the case, you may only want two rooms in which you're actually celebrating your Jewish faith and celebrating it. So I say, you know, cut it down. And think of, I think of it, think of there, there may be three people out there that don't have one, can't afford it. They're missing out on the, and you have three extras in a bag. They may be missing out on that. So share, remember, the whole idea is to share as best as you can and help everyone celebrate their lives as meaningful as possible. Coping with setbacks are going to be a critical element of what we do during this period of time. And, and that requires you really looking back at, at the chapters and applying and working through the exercises because we are only as successful as the tools that we use. You remember we talk about having that big toolkit and all you're using is a plier? That doesn't work. You've got to kind of make sure that everything is still working well and is sharp. You know, you can't pull out a matchup that you had, a machete that you had five years ago and expect it to cut as well as it does. No, you know, and this is the time of year where I always remember the folk that had the four or five different um, electric turkey um, knives electric knives and it's like um four of them are not working get the one that is working well and use that one and pass on the others to someone else everyone someone else may want to have to cut their turkey without breaking their shoulder so you can share cope with stress while keeping up an ongoing responsibility so remember managing the stress or the distress of hoarding allows you then 
to manage the distress or stress in other areas of your life. Because for so long, hoarding has taken up all your energy. And you may have forsaken other areas of your life that need some work. So now that you've moved to a better place, you have the energy and the resource and, and the acumen to address other concerns. You know, because sometimes when we get to this point of success with hoarding, then we have to conscientious look, conscientiously look at our social life. Maybe we've forgotten that we, we actually had one that we need to revisit or we need to enhance or expand. This is a great time to do so, particularly with, you know, both the pandemic and the challenges, we may have forsaken a lot of our social elements that we need to revisit, rekindle, and, and work on. Controlling hoarding helps with managing general stress. Remember that. If we're able to manage the biggest stressor, it tends to lend itself to the ability to manage the lesser ones. So access the resources available to you. Don't be afraid to do so. There's a lot out there. And, and we've offered some throughout this process, throughout this series, but we've also added some. So we have the International Obsessive Compulsive Disorder Foundation. It has a great deal of tools. Um, we know about the National Association of Professional Organizers who can come in and provide those professional elements in terms of organizing and structuring things for us. So there's lots of um, resources available to us that we need to access. Because <clears throat> one of the things about resources is if they're just sitting in a corner as a list and we're not accessing whether or not the access information is still current, whether those organizations are still working on the stuff, it's going to be very difficult for us. What I suggest and remind folks who are working with clients who are um, experiencing hoarding challenges is to the greatest holiday gift is to give someone a list of resources that they can use. So this can be part of a, you know, whether it's a holiday card or a holiday reminder, a gift of resources is really phenomenal for people who are still challenged by hoarding. So offer that. Planning for a life beyond hoarding. The pleasant life, enjoyable daily pleasures, things that we have either forsaken, forgotten, or not focused on. We need to revisit. The good life, using skills for enrichment. You know, there's an upcoming a new year. Do we want to revisit some classes that we said we were going to do for the last five years? And we were so focused on other things. This is the time to do it. The meaningful life, contributing to the greater good. You know, and Melody and other folks alluded to our, our contributions to goodwill and other places. This is the time for us to take stock of that. See how much things we have you know, provided and given. Also, this is a great time to be like, listen, I want to make sure that people in the community have some access to some of the goods that I have been storing here and not using. Remember the gift of, if you haven't used it in a year, it needs to go. This is the time to let it go with a great sense of a plum, a great sense of charity, a great sense of doing good, doing the right thing. Great opportunity to do so. Great way to relinquish things in a gifting way, in a meaningful way, and gives us a sense of purpose and a sense of value and a sense of community and good citizenry. Great time to do so. But I like beyond, go right ahead, Melody. Uh I just wanted to say in my area, which is in the Seattle area, many of the communities have a free Facebook page where people can go on and say, I have this stuff I want to get rid of. Does anybody yeah. want it? And uh, I like that, you know, just because sometimes they don't even have the $2 to go buy it at a Goodwill or, yeah. you know, a secondhand Absolutely. store. So. Absolutely. And we've talked about that, I think, in chapter nine or chapter 10, where we talk about look at those um, avenues to to offer things, because, yes, I don't expect everyone is going to have a truck to pack something and take it to stuff. So sometimes people will come get it or organizations will pick him up on the seasonal pickup. So it's a great time to do so. Don't forget your practice muscle. You know, we don't want to lose sight of we have to keep working at it. We have to keep getting up to that point of doing it daily. 
even when we have accomplished a lot of what we uh, set out to accomplish, this is a great time to keep working on it, to keep it decluttered. So are you keeping your practice muscle well conditioned? Are you working in those 60 minutes? If you have gotten to that point and you know you have most of your areas of your home clean and decluttered and sanitary, then it's about spending the time keeping that place um, in that manner so that you don't fall back into the trap of, of losing sight of your efforts. So need to work on your practice muscles. And most of all, give yourselves a special reward having gone through this entire process and cycle and got into this point of success. We talk about each phase. You reward yourself once you've put in the 60 minutes and you've gotten the work in. It is important to keep those rewards viable and in place. And when you've gotten to this point where you're at the maintenance stage, your rewards should be tangible, consistent, and meaningful to you. So at this point, one of the rewards can be actually entertaining guests. One of the rewards can actually be doing an activity that you desire and enjoy outside of your home, really, uh, regaining that life beyond hoarding, doing those things, whatever rewards work for you. You know, it may be at this point, I have a few days off from your organization. You do something that, is, that you enjoy, you go to a park, go to a place that, that really gives you inspiration and a sense of wellness and enjoy that. Or meeting up with family, maybe for the first time you're able to actually have family over to entertain, do that. Be unafraid to take on the challenge of socializing and engaging and attain a life and sustain a life beyond hoarding. It's going to be important to do so. So. We certainly have gotten to this point. I want to make sure that we are aware of all the things that we need to accomplish and we have accomplished and give ourselves a pat on the back and remind ourselves that we are powerful, we are self-disciplined, and we are able because we've come this far. And I hope that you've gained the gains that were critical and important to you and doesn't really, you know, because the one thing we need to do is to acknowledge where we are, how far we've come, and be able to celebrate our victories because they took hard work and perseverance and they, they, they require a good celebration to acknowledge those. So it's important to do so. Now, what I want to do is take a quick opportunity to ask you to complete the evaluation because we've spent a lot of effort and time and I want to get a sense from you as to how you really engage in that process um, and what this particular effort has meant to you and what did you find meaningful. So, and give us a sense as well as to how we can make this particular program as meaningful, as productive, um, for, for folks that we continue to work on. And one of the great um, things that we've had and we've learned is that we are going to, um, our work with um, Washington DBR has also enabled us to, um, to, re to do this again. So we're going to be redoing this um, learning community in the new year, both for folks who are new to um, so Buried in Treasures, as well as uh, folks who may just need a refresher or may have missed um, some of the different um, sessions and, and chapters to really gain that full understanding or full awareness, that's available to you. So we are excited about our opportunity to do it again, but I really want to um, thank you so much for a, a such a, a fantastic um, learning community. I know it took a lot of time and a lot of effort you put into this, and I want to thank you for those efforts and, 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 and certainly remind you that um, they, were, they were worthwhile and meaningful, and I hope you've gained the gains that you've um, came into this um, work 
learning community with and um, you can take take stock of it and, and celebrate yourself and, and, and to be grateful for what you have gained because you have made significant strides and continue to work on those areas. So that's that's significant. Yes, indeed, Chris. I'm excited as well for, for, for next year. We're going to be doing this again next year. And um, our hope is certainly that we get the best of um, get the best of the efforts. And more folks are able to actually engage with us and, and to develop um, the, the cachet of knowledge, skills, and resources that really enable them to tackle hoarding. In, in that meaningful way really helps folks get to the other side because there's another side there's the other side a life beyond hoarding so what i'm also going to suggest to you is to try and share to take back your life from hoarding and clutter and developing your self-care plan these are going to be critical elements to really help you sustain through the maintenance stage so take an opportunity to check out those uh, resources and, and utilize them as best you can um and I want to certainly remind you that we wish you well on your journey beyond hoarding. That's the idea. That, that was the goal and the purpose of this all. So I want to thank you. We appreciate your time and attention and participation. And today's webinar was hosted by DBHR through the Washington Healthcare Authority. I'd like to remind you that the slides and, and the recording is going to be made available to you. Don't forget to check out Foundational Community Supports Newsletter for all things FCS and upcoming training events. So the information for Merit Group is there as well for folks who want to become an F FCS provider. But I want to thank you wholeheartedly for your commitment to this process. And um, I hope that you share your knowledge, skills, and resources with your colleagues um, across provider agencies and with your loved ones and people who are impacted in any way by hoarding. Because as we know, getting to this side of it is, is, is a is a, a tremendous tremendous accomplishment and you have gained and you have the right to the um, congratulations getting here so i truly appreciate your individual and collective effort and want to thank you thank you so, earl you are most welcome I, I truly had a great time and i look forward to to doing so next year so I give we have a few more minutes. You certainly have the opportunity to pose your questions if you have them. I am all ears. Thank you so much, Earl. And a thing that helps me um, is the most important things in life are not things. Absolutely. Spot on, Debbie. No doubt about it. It's about it's about really enjoying the people. <laughs> enjoying those who are in your life right right that's what life is about yes and memories are the best thing sarah and i agree really create those and remember i always say every day you get up and you have breath you can create a memory and a history that you can honor and enjoy no shortage of opportunities um, Lee, I saw you asked the question is when we'll sign up for next year's webinar series be available. I'm not certain, but we will certainly make sure that you, for all the people who have attended throughout the 12 sessions, that information is going to be shared with you as soon as it's available. So we look forward to that. And Mary, <laughs> we're all in the process of changing our ways. So you have good company. And thank you, Slavana. Absolutely, Chris. Have a great, great rest of the year. I'm glad we were able to offer you the tools. Um, Natasha, certainly you can sign up as soon as the um, next year's session has been scheduled. Uh, that would be great. So you get an opportunity to revisit all the, the chapters that we've worked on. And hoping next year we can kind of build on build on this and really bring some more um, tools and strategies into it. So don't be um, 
attend anytime. Whenever you came into this process, we're glad to have you. And we hope you've learned something. And the material is still there for you to kind of gather. So, Teresa, thank you. Thank you. Now I'm going to be hoarding all the saved episodes for the last year. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We, we will use the word collect. We will collect and practice, right? We will use it. If we use it, it's not hoarding, right? We have to gotcha. say that mode. Absolutely. Bye. So I'm glad. All righty. Well, do enjoy the rest of your day and have a happy holiday season. It's been my pleasure. And I hope that you um, have a great, great um, 2023, great new year. So take good care. Um, Stacy, previous recordings, um, you can reach out to Kimberly um, at DBHR and they will send you um, all the recordings and the, um, the PDFs of the, of the sessions. Happy holidays, Juan.